flourishing is all about giving back. It's growing out. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than a person. It's understanding, mm -hmm. you know what? I have been invested in. I'm going to invest back. It's about legacy. It's thinking beyond just here and now and today. And it's, it's beyond accumulation. Uh, thriving is more accumulation-based of, of uh, wealth, power, whatever position, title, whereas um, flourishing is a, is a flowing out of. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's the major difference for me is that when you start to realize, you know what, life is bigger than me, and I, I, live, um, I need to live a life that is dedicated to purpose and meaning beyond me, um, that's where you begin to think more along the flourishing lines and, instead of just thriving. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flow Over Fear podcast, where it is our mission to help you to rise above fear and realize your ultimate potential in leadership and life. I'm your host, Adam Hill, and it is my goal to share with you the human side of high performance. My guests share their experience with fear, anxiety, struggle, challenge, and most importantly, despite all of it, how they rose above it to achieve incredible results. So if you're ready to rise up, let's get started. Welcome to Flow Over Fear, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I have a great guest today. His name is Matt Lesser, and he is the founder and CEO of Uniquely Normal. Uh, uniquely, you, uniquely Normal exists, easy for me to say, to help organizations build flourishing cultures by building individuals that flourish. Matt is a best-selling author of the book Unsatisfied, which was released just a few months ago and is selling very well uh, when less is more. And uh, so the book is called Unsatisfied When Less Is More. And uh, his second book is expected to release in the fall and winter of 2023. So expect that to be coming out. Matt has in the, had the honor of training leaders, teams, and boards in over 40 countries over the past 20 years. And he has served in as, a, as an executive on many business as well. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of this conversation. It's going to be a, a great conversation on how to rise above fear uh, and lead in the best way. Matt's greatest treasures are his faith, his family, and his friends. He resides in Northeast Indiana with his family, and he joins us today. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. I'm great to have you here. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. So I want to kind of dive in a little bit with with your history yep. as you know, you've written a book, you, you're training leaders and you have, uh, you have a pretty amazing story and amazing background having served as a leader yourself. How did you get into the leadership that you're in and, and kind of get into that idea of training leaders? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Adam. And, um, to, to get, to get there, I need to rewind, uh, really back to the start of my career, if you will. And, and that is, um, after, after I graduated from college, I went to college. Um, I was one of those, those weird kids that when I went to college, I knew exactly what I wanted to study and going in the door, and I didn't deviate. So I didn't change my major, didn't change my minors, and, uh, and so and I wanted to study business. And uh, so I graduated from business, and I went into the family business, which is something that um, as I w when I went to, into college, I thought that's what I wanted to do, but by the time I graduated, I didn't want to do. Uh, but yet, yeah, that's where I wound up. Mm. So needed a job, and hey, there was a job, so I took it. Um, a year into that, uh, I literally went to my my dad and 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 uh, said, "Dad, um, this isn't working, and uh, one of us needs to go, and it's probably not going to be uh, you because you own the stock. So uh, I'm going to leave and go to grad school and figure figure this thing called life out." And uh, never forget that conversation. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, sit down. And my dad, big guy, played football in college. And so I sat down. And he said, uh, he said, actually, he says, I, I'm, I am leaving. And he did. And on the way out the door, he literally just signed the business over to me. And uh, he left. And, uh, and, and I took over. And so it was, it was one of those things that uh, academics has uh, always come easy to me. And so, therefore, I thought that this thing called business would as well. I mean, heck, I studied it in college, and so, hey, why not? And, boy, um, I've often said now that I went to college to get my degree and went into business to get my education, and it's so true. And so, uh, within the first three months, I uncovered uh, just 
uh, mountain after mountain after mountain of issues. Uh, there was uh, insurmountable trade debt that had happened, and I was not aware of that. There was uh, polluted properties. We were in the wholesale oil industry, and and the big one was is that uh, uh, if you don't pay withholding tax for a period of time, the uh, the IRS uh, they don't like that, and so um, so I had all these no. come down to me at the same time, <laughs> and uh, I spiraled into a deep uh, depression. And I didn't know any of the terminology at the time, began experiencing panic attacks, not sleeping, um, and finally to the point that um, about six months into my, uh, my, my, my venture of being the president of a company, uh, I, I, I wasn't getting out of bed. And um, about two months after mm-hmm. that, um, I had decided that uh, it, life wasn't worth living. And, um, and interestingly, mm-hmm. and, I, and I, I won't tell the full story because it, it'll take too long, but the day that I actually decided that life was over for me, um, it was just one, literally one miracle after another. And I wound up sitting in front of uh, who wound up becoming my mentor and then later on my boss, believe it or not, um, someone that had gone through something very similar a decade prior to what I went through and uh, spent a half a day with him and literally just kind of vomited all over his desk, not literally, but, you know, figuratively. And um, at the end of that time, uh, this guy's uber successful, uh, wealthy. I mean, he could have written and stroked a check for literally pocket change that would have fixed all my problems. And and he didn't, and I'm grateful he didn't. And uh, But at the end of that time, he said, I will walk with you through this. And and that was all I needed. That was a thread of hope that I needed to live another day and then another day and then a week, and then a month, and then a year, and then years. Um, and so I was removed from the business for uh, period, about six months, uh, Was uh, got help. Um, and uh, and while I was out then, uh, he actually did send in a team of people to see what we had. Uh, I had hired my mom, and so uh, he worked with her, and we were able to restart the business. And then from there, it, it grew, and it flourished um, for about 10 years. And then it grew to the point that, uh, mm-hmm. I had a big decision to make on uh, if I was going to leverage everything literally and try to go for the next level um, or sell to one of my competitors who I, I knew would take care of our employees. And that was ultimately the decision we made to do. And so so did that and then went into private equity for uh, 12 years, worked for my, my friend, my mentor, the, the man who walked with me through that dark period. And uh, and that's mm-hmm. where um, so I was I was in the trenches, obviously, in my own business. And then. Um, in, in when I was in private equity then for, for about seven years, um, I literally traveled the world looking for business opportunities to invest into. So we were in, in our kind of our sweet spot was investing in owner operator businesses that had grown, um, you know, anywhere from, let's say, five million to 25 million in, in top line revenue. And so every day mm-hmm. I was talking with leaders and leadership teams and and I began to uh, I began to see uh, a pattern. It was a story that turned into a pattern, and the pattern was this, Adam. It was um, these 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 men and women had had spent most of their of their lives climbing either you know climbing the proverbial corporate ladder or uh, you know sacrificing doing whatever it takes to build their business into um, a, a, into a, a point where they were considered successful. I mean, if you looked at their lives, you'd say, man, they're thriving, they're successful, they have discretionary income, they have, you know, they have the lake house, they have the extra car, they have the boat, they have, you know, whatever, whatever, they can take whatever vacation they want. And, uh, and, and, and by society's definition, they were living an enviable life, right? Mm -hmm. And yet when we talk with them one-on-one, I got a very different story, oftentimes with tears. And oftentimes stories filled with regret of saying things like, this is it? I have worked all this Mm -hmm. and I've sacrificed, oftentimes it was I sacrificed my marriage, sacrificed my kids, sacrificed, you know, whatever it might be. And um, for what? And and literally it was, this is it? And so they became um, so disillusioned that they either didn't want to be in business anymore. And so that's where, you know, I had the opportunity then, obviously being in private equity, to invest in the business, buy the business, whatever. Um, and so that they could try to then make up for all that lost time. And mm-hmm. at least that's the perception anyway. And so um, that's what, um, again, that, that happened many different, it happened many times on different continents, different countries. So it wasn't just a U.S. thing. 
um, or just a European thing, which U.S. and European culture are very similar. Um, but I saw this, you know, at, at, in Africa as well. And so it's like, okay, so what? Mm. What is that? And what can be done differently? And 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 it got to the point too that I was in a similar situation in my own life. You know, I was climbing the corporate ladder at this at this private equity firm, and but I was starting to ask those same questions. Like, wait a minute, I don't want to get into my late forties, fifties, and climb the ladder, get to the top and say, this is it, or man, I climbed the wrong ladder, right? Sure. And so I began to write about it. And that's how, really, that's how the book on uh, Unsatisfied was birthed, at least in my mind. So is that helpful? Gotcha. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so, the, so the book that you've written, uh, the un Unsatisfied, which was recently released, is all about that story of kind of how you came up into you know, from that, and that's, there, there's a lot of fascinating things in here and a lot I can relate to personally, because you kind of took, you took over an oil company or, or a petroleum business, you know, a year after graduating college. And so kind of got thrown into the fire right after that. And then, oh, yeah. um, and then that led to some depression. I took over the family business, which we're a chemical company. Huh. So I can relate to a lot of that. We have the same, similar kind of background with the uh, uh, panic attacks anxiety. Um, fortunately for, for me, I guess I, I'd experienced that earlier and, and spent enough time in the family business that when I became the leader in that role, it had, uh, it had, um, uh, I, you know, I'd been with the company long enough, so I knew what was going on. I knew that there were changes that needed to be made, but that's a difficult thing. That's a hard thing to get thrown into. Um, it sounds like, you know, the idea of having a mentor or somebody that can help you through that or walk with you through it, as you say, was a really helpful piece to that to kind of get you out of it and onto the other side. Is that, does that, is that accurate? Oh my. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I, I could not, I wouldn't be who I am today without the, the men that have invested into me literally since I was a teenager. And, um, and I, I cannot, I cannot, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, even to the point that today, when I started my business um, about a year and a half ago, a little over a year and a half ago now, um, I had a, uh, a a wise mentor. He's a wise guy. I mean, he's eighty two. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Eighty two years old, absolutely no filter whatsoever. I love that about him. And uh, he, he right. came to. We served on a board together. That's how we met. And so he came to me when he found out that I was going to start my business, and he said, uh, "He said, Matthew, don't do it alone." And uh, I said, what? So what, what do you mean? And he said, I said, I can't afford to, I said, I'm starting up, man. I can't afford to hire anybody. And uh, he said, put together a personal board of directors. And I just said, what's that? Mm. And he said, find four or five people that you know, love you and care about you and care about you enough that they will speak truth to you even when it hurts. Um, because that's the time mm. you need to hear it the most. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And you're member number one, right? And, and he agreed. Um, and, uh, and so we meet quarterly, you know, we meet, we meet every quarter, just like a regular board meeting half a day. And it's, it's, uh, three men that love me, respect me and care about me enough to have the hard conversations and, and my wife. And, uh, and, and so these four people, um, I just, I value them. I respect them. I love them dearly. And I know they do the same with me and, and Adam, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now without them. In fact, I went through a real lull uh, after the release of my book and was literally at the point of, oh, crap, now what? You know, the book just came out. What am I, what am I yeah. doing now? And I was literally ready just to pitch it and say, you know what? And I literally went to my board meeting uh, in, in, in late October and said, um, I was just in a funk and just said, you know what? Hey, nice ride, but it's over. I'm just going to get a job and I'm, I'm done with this. And to a person, they said, mm -hmm. no, you're not. And, uh, and they literally rewound wow. and said, where did we start? Where are we now? And where are we going? It's like, no, we're sorry. We're not mm -hmm. letting you quit. We care about you too much. And, and that was the, uh, honestly, that was one of the catalytic moments that it's like, okay, then I guess I better start writing again. Cause I already had an idea for the next book. So anyway, sorry, I'm rambling, but sure. No, not, not at all. Please ra ramble on because I, I, the concept of the, the personal board of directors, I really like that idea. And I want to kind of dive into that a little bit more because it, now, is that personal board of directors for you, is is that specific to 
issues that just you're facing, or is it more of a mastermind where you're you're working with each other's issues, or are you or, or are you so, solely focused on just your life, and, and then you might serve on their board, so to speak? Uh, that's a great question. They don't. Um, so two of the uh, two of the four are um, they're re- they're retired from a day to day job. They do some consulting work, and the third is the CEO of a, mm-hmm. of a larger company. Um, so they don't have personal boards per se, um, but I will say that at these meetings there is some there is definitely an an air of uh, iron sharpening iron. You know Proverbs twenty seven seventeen, and so it's not like yeah. it's the match show. Um, you know, the, the primary purpose is to, um, is, is, is for, I, I, I was threefold encouragement, um, challenge and accountability. And so those are the three major, uh, the three major words I would say that we focus on. And when we get together, um, the updates that I provide them then in between board meetings, I focus on three areas. And, and the first is, is, uh, faith. Second is family. And then third is the business. And, um, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm an open book. I mean, in some, sometimes these board meetings, we talk about the business. Sometimes we talk about the book. Sometimes we talk about personal journey. Um, sometimes all three, but every board meeting is unique. And even though I, you know, I have a prepared agenda, um, we rarely follow it to a T. And so, and I, and I love that about this, you know, it's just been, sure. um, it's been an amazing experience to have this. And I, I cannot recommend this highly enough. I mean, it's just, a I literally would not be sitting here, I don't think, uh, without these four people uh, that have been prodding me, encouraging me, kicking me in the pants occasionally. So, Well, I, I can't uh, speak more highly to it myself just because the power of community to get us mm. not only out of our own funks but to, but to roll ideas off of, to, to, as you say, iron sharpening iron, it's such a powerful tool. Community, the right type of community is such a yes. powerful tool. And so it, it helped you, I mean, at least getting that, getting that mentor, getting that personal board of directors helped you to kind of get out of that funk, learn the processes. Was there anything else that kind of helped shift you out of that depression? I mean, there's a lot of overwhelm when all of that stuff is hitting you at once. You know, we've just taken over a business. A lot of this stuff is, is hitting you. How, what else, what other tools did you have that helped you get out of that, that funk of depression? Uh, wow. It was, um, so I would say there were probably two or three major um, major things that that happened. One was um, the counselor that I was assigned to, um, and uh, and literally was assigned to. And so never I didn't know this guy from uh, from the man in the moon, and uh, he wound up walking with me for over six years. And actually, it was just me me and my wife. Um, when this all happened, I should have mentioned my wife and I had only been married for a year. So, I mean, it was a, uh, it oh, was, wow. so it rocked our marriage as well, as you can imagine. And so, um, sure. so I, I look back on this now, we both do, and look back on this, on that time period and say, you know, really it was, um, there was a whole lot of God's grace and mercy in that because I knew who I was at that time and I knew um, my flaws and I, I had some fatal flaws and, and those mm-hmm. flaws most likely would have train wrecked my marriage. Now, I can't say that for sure. Yeah. Um, but I'm very grateful that I went through that. I mean, I don't want to repeat it necessarily, but I would if that's what it takes. Um, so the counselors won. Second was um, I was medicated. I was medicated for um, uh, the better part of two years and quite heavily at first because mm-hmm. my brain chemicals were so out of whack. Um, you know, it's, I learned a lot about brain chemistry during that period, that time period about how, you know, if you're under that kind of stress, that kind of pressure, you know, your brain is constantly firing and you're basically exhausting the, uh, the neurons. And that's part of what causes the depression yeah. is that you're constantly flooding your body with, with adrenaline and norepinephrine. And so, um, and so I learned a lot about that. And so the, the meds helped me regain some kind of balance again. And then, then the third mm-hmm. was, um, the third was having a, uh, um, a, uh, having mentors and it was more than one, but one primary that walked with me. And I've often said that, um, it was during the years that followed that, that I had, um, some amazing, uh, men in particular that invested in me and helped me to learn how to be, you know, I was a very good student. I didn't know, I, I, I didn't need to be taught that I needed to learn though, how to be, how to be, um, a husband, how to be a, uh, eventually a father, yeah. how to be a business owner. Um, how to be a man of integrity, really a man of character, because I, I didn't know 
really any what that meant. So is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you I, I'm really glad you're telling this story because a lot of people, especially leaders, need to hear this. And and as you said a little bit earlier, you know, you, you ran into a lot of leaders that that for all intents and purposes, everything on the outside looks like it's going so well. But internally, there's a lot of a lot of struggle, a lot of challenge, a lot of you know, depression, sadness, a lot of is this it? You know, and 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 those are questions we deal with at, at every level. Um, it's not always, you know, roses and unicorns for, for us. So things like therapy that, that you're getting, medication, I mean, that we, we, I mean, I know that as leaders, we want to, we want our egos to get the best of us a lot of times, and we don't want to think that we need that. But, but the story of, but there's often times in leadership that we're going to feel hopeless. We're going to feel like nothing's working. We're going to feel like there's no way out. And it's through those times where we need to take care of ourselves. We need the community. We need the therapy. We need the, you know, medication. We need the mentors in those times. So I'm very glad you're telling the story and you're doing what you're doing because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's saving lives. I mean, that, that really comes down to it is saving businesses. Um, and so you, you, so you wrote a book, uh, you know, about a lot of this and, um, and, and so it, it kind of around that unsatisfied uh, uh, topic, you know, a lot of these leaders have that burnout that they that they start to feel. Um, what are what are some of the tools and solutions you might offer to somebody who's starting to feel that burnout? Hmm. Um, that's a yeah, great uh, great question again, Adam. Um, what uh, so? The way that I, I wrote the book, um, I didn't write this. This is not a self-help book. I, I despise self-help books. Right. Um, this is a, a book that tells tells a story. A lot of it is, is um, so it's my story. And then there's a model in there that I worked on for the course of about five years. It's called the Flourishing Life Model. And then the, the third part of the book is dedicated all to integration and application. Um, I, I didn't want the readers to walk away and say, okay, nice story, nice model, wonderful, great, put it on the shelf, there's just dust now that collects on it. I wanted them to be able to do something with it. So I, I want them, my hope is, by the time they get to part three, they say, great, now what do I do? Well, wonderful, that's mm -hmm. why part three is written. And so I would say that people that are uh, on the verge of, of burnout or they're beginning to ask the questions, you know, now what, you know, or is this it? Um, you know, the first thing that I encourage people to do is write your story. Don't just tell it. If you don't want to write it, fine. Tell it to someone or speak it into a, into a, a recording device, uh, but then have somebody mm -hmm. transcribe it. Write your story, and I don't mean the Cliff's Notes version. I mean your full-on story the, with all the details, the nitty-gritty, uh, the good and the bad, the challenging and the victories, um, and, and, and get that down. And, and, and so the reason why, and I, I get this, you know, why is that important? It's important to write it because it's difficult to know where you want to go until you know both where you are now and where you've been. And mm -hmm. I think that so it's so easy to forget where we've been, you know, both the, the challenges but also the victories. You know, this, this, this life is full of both. And it's easy yeah. when we get into a funk to just focus on the negative, focus on the bad. Right. And, and then when we, we look at our story, you know, we begin to see, oh, wait a minute. You know, yeah, my, my life has some challenges, but my life also has some pretty cool aspects to it. And that helps provide hope for, OK, what's next? Um, the next thing that I, I recommend for for people is um, and I talk about this in the book as well is, you know, answer four questions. You know, what are you passionate about? What are you gifted and skilled at doing? I mean, really good at doing like you can do it in your sleep kind of a thing. Um, and then back back to passion. Passion, you know, what, what keeps you up at night in a good way that you just, you, you think about it all the time, you dream about it, those kinds of things. The third question is, how do you contribute value to others? And that, that's affirmed by others. How do others say you contribute mm -hmm. value to them? And the fourth one is your calling. You know, what do you feel called to do? What is what is your your dream? What is that thing that is constantly nagging at you that you just can't get away from? And in the intersection of those four is is a place where you can um, begin to intentionally live a flourishing life, or at least you're on the journey toward a flourishing life. And so, gotcha. um, but it really starts with you know you have to know yourself. So that's why story is so important. 
and then I give some mm-hmm. other other things in the in the in part three. You know, take some assessments. You know, get really get to know yourself. Um, ask the questions. You know, what is your why? You know, why are you here? What's your purpose? And then one mm-hmm. of my favorite exercises is to think about your legacy. So fast forward to the end of your life and look back on it. Hopefully it's a long lived, well, good life. And, and you're looking back on it and you, you imagine yourself it's kind of morbid, but Hey, it works. Imagine yourself sitting in your own funeral. What are the three things you most want said about you? And whenever I've done this exercise, mm-hmm. I never hear, I wish I had more zeros, in my bank account. You know, I wish I had a bigger business or I wish yeah. I had more cars or it's usually things like, I wish I spent more time with my family. You know, I wish I had taken that vacation. I promised. Yeah. We should, have, you know, those kinds of things. So. I, I love that exercise too. That the one of looking back on your, of looking forward and looking back on your life, because it, it's something that I've done pretty frequently. And I, I, I recall uh, once watching. Uh, uh, I think Jimmy Carter had a health scare many years ago. And regardless of what anybody thinks about the politics of it, you know, just thinking Jimmy Carter's a, a pretty, you know, and he's in his nineties, I believe, but he had a health scare where he was pretty close to death at one point. And, um, and having come back from it, he was sitting in an interview chair and somebody asked him, well, what were you thinking at that time? And I remember seeing his face just light up and he smiled and who smiles when they think of themselves about to die. And he, and he, and he had this smile on his face and he said, I thought of my family. I thought of the things that I had done. I thought of, you know, traveling. I thought of, you know, doing all of this stuff, you know, for, building homes. And he was just naming off all these things and smiling. And I thought to myself, that's it. That's the secret to life. That's what you want to achieve is you want to look back on that life at that moment. And uh, so that's such a powerful tool. And and I also love the idea of writing your story because, you know, um, just the idea of, 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 of remembering those points in time, as you say, that, that you might've forgotten, especially when they get lost in all of the day to day that, you know, you, you tend to, you know, feel all the negative. I, I don't know if you're planning to do an audiobook or if you have an audiobook out. I actually read my audiobook recently over the course of two days. And man, that was powerful to actually read the story over two days was just like, wow. Um, it was an emotional roller coaster, but, but a pretty amazing experience. So to, to that end, it, those are some great tools to, to remember that. Um, now you mentioned the flourishing part because that's the first time I've really heard that word used in this context, mm-hmm. and I and I I'm interested in that because I hear people talk about you know live a life where you're thriving or, or that sort of thing. What is the difference that you see in in flourishing versus say thriving? You know, and that was the key differentiator um, in uh, when I was doing the research for uh, for the book. Because I, I got to thriving pretty mm-hmm. easily, and, and because the people that I was working with, they, they were thriving. Um, you know, especially if, when you look up the definition, even they were thriving. You know, they. But but the difference between the two, um, in fact, the the original working title of the book was Beyond Thriving, because I kept asking, mm-hmm. you know, what is Beyond Thriving? These the people that I'm seeing, they are thriving but they're not satisfied. So what's next? What's beyond that? Um, but when I did some yeah. test marketing, nobody got it. So I didn't, I didn't go with that. Um, so, um, so, but I kept asking the question, what is beyond thriving? And then I had this conversation with a friend of mine and he brought the word flourishing and he was talking about it in a context that we often see. And that's, what does it take to get to humans, humans to flourish, human flourishing. Mm-hmm. And that usually means, you know, basic sustenance, food, shelter, clothing, those kinds of things. Um, but the word captured me. And so I began doing mm-hmm. research on the word itself. And um, I was just in, I was just basically captured by it. And it's like, you know what? Flourishing also means um, it means uh, growth beyond uh, a person or, or I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but it's like, OK, that's it. Flourishing is all about giving back. It's growing out. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than a person. It's understanding, mm-hmm. you know what? I have been invested in, I'm going to invest back. It's about legacy. It's thinking beyond just here and now and today. And it's, it's beyond accumulation. Uh, thriving is more accumulation-based of, of uh, wealth, power, whatever position, title, whereas um, flourishing is a, is a flowing out of. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and so that's the major difference for me is that when you start to realize, you know what? Life is bigger than me. And I, I live, um, I need to live a life that is dedicated to purpose and meaning beyond me. 
um, that's where you begin to think more along the flourishing lines and instead of just thriving. Yeah. It was that a big switch for you for, from going to the point where you were working in businesses and, and, and you know, helping inter, internally your family businesses succeed, but then also now you're, you're helping other leaders and organizations succeed. Is that, was that a big switch for you on that? Oh yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. It's, and I'm on the journey, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm there all the way because, you know, I have my days where, you know, as I said before, I have days where I'm like, is this, is this really worth it? And the answer I know is yes. Um, but it, you know, I have those emotional moments where it's like, okay, this is really hard, but it's worth it. And I don't want to go back to, um, the way it used to be that way it stopped working for me. It just <laughs> stopped working. And, um, I didn't like who I was quite frankly. Um, when I was in that place. And so, so I'm committed to this. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I use this example in the book and I, I love the story of Cortez 1519 burn the ships, you know, about a year and a half ago, man, yeah. I, I burned those ships. So I'm all in and, uh, you know, sink or swim, I'm all in. So we're making it, we're making it work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could tell in, in that you're lit up about this and, and that you're passionate about it and you've got a, you've got a powerful story and, you know, not only that, but the powerful experience of, of going through the turmoil and then coming out the other side stronger and knowing that you had a community and you're becoming that community. And that's the important piece. Um, you know, and I think I think leaders need to hear that, too, is that, you know, a lot of times getting out of that crucible that we're working in or, or whatever, whatever the challenge is, a lot of times it's 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 starting to work with other people, not just for your own benefit, but for other people's benefit, you know, to help them succeed as well. And that's going to help you. Um, so again, it gets back to that idea of community. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and that to me sounds like intentional living, uh, which is something you talk about. And, and so what is, what does that intentional living mean to you? Um, it, it really means, um, not living life by accident or letting life just happen. You know, I, I really believe, I think one of the things that I, I kept running into again, when I would work with these, these leaders all over the world is, is, um, they get to a point of saying, I'm not even sure how I got here, you know, and, and, yeah. and that's where some of that regret is. And they were making decisions in the moment that they thought were the right decision. It, and it, as far as it was for building their businesses or whatever it was, but when they, they never step back from it to say, okay, is this really what I want to be doing? And so I think just the, the difference is intentional living is stepping back and saying, okay, what is the trajectory of my life? What are the decisions I'm making now? And are these the decisions that align with who I say I am and say I, who I want to be? Um, because if it isn't, then I need to make some changes now. Yeah. So I, I, um, I, I like that definition because not not living by accident. That's that's hugely important, and I think even not just as individuals, but even as organizations. I know you work with organizations. You worked in organizations. Organizations feel a lot of the same emotions as as just human beings do, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll they'll experience that fear. They'll experience that that uh, um, uh, that uncertainty, or um, you know, d the decisions that are made might might lead them into unintentional living. Yeah. Um, and so even organizations need to focus on how they, as you say, flourish. How do organizations um, do that? How do they create the cultures that would allow them to flourish? Well, now you're leading. This is what I'm actually writing about right now. So um, the, oh, book great. I'm working on, the book I'm working on right now, uh, interestingly enough, this is the book that I actually wanted to write the first time, um, but it, it's not what popped out. And there's many reasons why. Um, and actually, I'm glad it didn't because uh, what I wrote already and uh, the coaching and the training I got while writing that was just phenomenal. And it's helping me uh, write this next one. But this next one is dedicated to um, building flourishing organizations, and it's by building flourishing team members. Um, you know, as you just mentioned, organizations are emotional because your people are emotional. Well, organizations are people, and, and people are part of organizations. And I think that organizations forget that sometimes. And so, you know, whenever I'm working with leaders or leadership teams, I, I can't tell you, I, I almost have a visceral reaction whenever I see FTE, because like, okay, those FTEs are people, all right? Those people represent lives. Those lives represent families. Those families represent more people. And, um, and I think that we forget that sometimes and we try to dehumanize mm -hmm. it because somehow I think it makes it easier when we have to do very hard things like 
lay somebody off or fire somebody or whatever. And I get that. But it, it doesn't change the fact that um, we have responsibilities as leaders. And I think that's a great responsibility. I think leadership is a wonderful responsibility, but it's also a tremendous burden. And so, and I think that we have a responsibility to do it well. And that means mm -hmm. that we do the best we can to work with our team members, those people that work with us and for us, um, to help them become flourishing. So, because when people flourish, organizations flourish. But when we treat people like they're not people, like they're just a, you know, a, like just hired help or whatever words you want to put around that, and, and, and we treat them like they're less than, then we get less mm -hmm. than, right? And so I, um, I'm doing the best I can with people that I can influence and, and ha have an influence with to th redo your thinking on that. And think about your people in terms of how can I help my people flourish? Because when they flourish, the organization will flourish. So that's... Yeah, where I'm focused right now. Well, that's great. I'm looking forward to that coming out. How do you how do you focus? Um, so, as, as a leader, how do you how do you find that balance though of, of really looking at the human side of 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 the business uh, uh, and and you know making sure you're holding people accountable? Because that's that's that, that's always a challenge for some leaders is is maybe not going too far towards the end of. Yeah, you know, maybe taking care of the biz of the people, so to speak. Yeah, and um, I, you're right. And I think that not holding people accountable is uh, is not kind, mm -hmm. because when when somebody mm -hmm. is not producing like they should be producing, then I think that we have to look at one of it's one of four reasons, one of five reasons. So either they're not properly trained, they don't have the proper tools or resources they need to do the job, they don't have the skills to do the job or they don't have the desire or the willingness to do the job. The first mm -hmm. three are on the organization, right? So they need to make sure they're properly trained, they have the tools they need, and that they, um, that they hire people with the proper skills or they, they give them the skills they need. But if somebody doesn't have the desire or the, um, or the, des the desire or the, uh, whatever I just said, <laughs> sorry, um, the ability, not the ability. The skills, but, yeah, but, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> they don't have the desire to do the job, I can't do much with that. And so it's not fair and it's not kind if I don't hold that person accountable for the job that they do. And if they're not getting the results that, that is necessary for that role, then again, it's not kind if I don't address that and, and help them mm -hmm. either become successful in their role, find a different role where they can be successful, or allow them to succeed at a different organization. That's all kind. And you can do yeah. that in a kind way. That's a great point. And I, I, I love that perspective because um you know i think a lot of uh, uh, men, many leaders may ignore that idea of, of holding people accountable because they don't want to rock the boat they don't want to hurt somebody's feelings but in reality they're just protecting themselves and i'm yeah. guilty of this too you know it, it's it's a scary thing to have to confront someone with the realities of of the business or, or hold them accountable but you're also right it's the kind thing and that kindness oftentimes takes courage so yeah. that's 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 huge i i, I think it's important and I think many times, Adam, that the, okay. um, you know, if, if people are not being successful in their in their role, you know, most people know it, mm -hmm. and and they're doing the best they can to to kind of fake it till they make it. But many times they just don't make it. Yeah. But yet they're they're scared. They don't want to lose their job, and uh, they don't want to admit it because they don't lose their job. <laughs> and so, um, right. so <laughs> having the conversation, from my perspective, is the kind thing to do. And yeah, it's the hard thing to do, but I think it's the kind thing to do. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Oh, I'm looking forward to that next book that's coming out. What's it What's it called? Or do you have a name for it yet? Um, I have a working title. Uh, I don't know where it's going to wind up yet, but I'm taking the same un theme. So right now it's called Unengaged, uh, Building Engaged and Flourishing Organizations or Teams. I'm not gotcha. sure which. And that's coming. Still working on it. Okay, and that's coming out next year. Yes, yes, that's the plan. Yep. Great. I'm, um, I'm about yeah. three quarters of the way through the manuscript right now and uh, hopefully finish that up and then get into the publishing process here, hopefully Q1. Nice, excellent. And um, so I want to I want to kind of take a step back uh, to, as we kind of close out here. I wanted to ask you when you um, when you think of that time when you were first starting out, because I was I'm picturing you as you're just getting married, because it sounds like you were getting married and you were starting this position as president of, of your family business at the same time. It sounds like a very, very exciting time for you. Um, and 
I, I would love to know that if, if with all of your experience that you've had thus far in your life, if you can go back and tell that person who's kind of standing at the altar, you know, getting married, starting this new, new uh, position, if you could tell that person one thing, what would that be? Um, I only get one. <laughs> um, <I've, laughs> well, you could anything you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> um, acknowledge, not, not even acknowledge. It's stronger than acknowledge. Um, uh, own that you need God and you need others in your life. Hmm. That's I a was great, highly, highly great... independent at that time. And I was arrogant. Yeah. So you thought you could do it all on your own with the, I really with the did. business? I really did. And yeah. It was part of my own hubris that, uh, because I didn't ask for help and it, yeah. Well, I wonder how many, how many of the listeners, how many people out there are, um, feeling that way too, or feeling like they're the burden that the weight of everything that's on their shoulders right now is just too much because they're carrying too much and they're not asking for that help. They're not finding that help elsewhere. And I wonder how many people, you know, and, I, and I'm excited to see how many people you're going to help through that process because of how many people need it and see that what you're doing in the world based on your experience and, and, and what you've done is going to change their lives. So I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for what you are going to show to people. Um, how can people find you and, and where can they find you? Where can they reach out? Um, so I have a very limited social presence. I do have a LinkedIn profile. So it's uh, Matthew Lesser is uh, my LinkedIn profile. Uh, my email is matt at uniquelynormal.com. Uh, so just uniquely normal, all lowercase, uh, two words, but combined uniquelynormal.com or my website is www.uniquelynormal.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for being here. This, you have an amazing story. You have an amazing mission and, uh, and you have a, an amazing book. And I, and if people want to find that, go to Amazon, check it out, uh, look for his next book coming out sometime next year and certainly visit, uh, visit his website, email him and, and reach out to him. Um, I appreciate you being here, Matt. And until next time, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Flow Over Fear podcast. If you'd like to learn more about getting into flow and learn the foundations of flow, I have a free video series on my website at www.adamcliffordhill.com called The Foundations of Flow. Feel free to go there and download it and start your journey to rising above fear and achieving greater flow in your life. And if you like this episode, and I'm guessing you did if you stuck around for this long, then please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button and you will receive notifications when I have new interviews, new recaps, and new trainings that pop up on YouTube. Thanks again for joining us.